um, this evening um, called Feel Good, Do Good Work. That is the title of um, Kelly and Annette's uh, book. Um, they're both uh, well-being of business psychologists and they're going to be giving a great um, introduction into their content as well as um, how their content is important to what we're going to be discussing today. So um, I won't wait too much longer. Um, it's, actually, it's actually the anniversary of the publication, so uh, I will allow Annette and Kelly to introduce themselves uh, very shortly. Um, but thank you everyone for attending. And uh, without further ado, I will uh, allow Annette and Kelly to take over. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Reese. Um, thanks. Thanks for inviting us on as well. Um, brilliant to be here. Really delighted. And um, hi to everybody listening. So, um, yeah, it's our first year anniversary. I'm Annette Gann, um, co-author of Feel Good, Do Good Work, and I'm a performance and well-being coach. And uh, again, you know, as we reiterated what Annette said, welcome to the, this call this evening and um, thank you for coming along. My name is Kelly Milburn. And I'm the other co-author of Feel Good, Do Good Work, and I'm a leadership coach. So, Kelly, I mean, it's um, it's amazing, isn't it, to be one year on already, um, when yeah. you think about the year that it's been. Um, I, I really, we'd never planned, um, and who did, to um, to launch a book during a pandemic. Absolutely. And, um, but actually, it's, it's probably turned out to be um, not such a bad thing, really, because you know, I guess the subtitle of the book is how caring is great for business and businesses everywhere really have had to to really show how they are caring for their employees to try and get them through this this really tricky period, aren't they? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And they're the um, I think all the work that I've been involved in in that year, as well as, um, you know, launching the book and publishing the book, um, it's it's been a turbulent year. Uh, and the, some organisations have really cracked the formula for hybrid working, the whole well-being piece. And some of those um, organisations you've, you've um, cited in those chapters at the back, at, back of the book, and, you know, the case studies. So it's some really good practice, but it's not been easy to get it right because every audience has slightly different needs. You know, some people have to be at work. You, you know, if you're a key worker, you don't have the choice to sit in the comfort of your slippers <laughs> at your home desk um, so yeah so it's been a very interesting year and and um really good for refocusing i found how about you yeah you i mean I, I think um i think really if we think about what the premise for writing the book was um it, I, there's an element of um self-care for both of us yeah. i think we were both at a point where um, we've been juggling busy lives, busy families, um, you know, on my side, single parenting, um, although very much a pleasure to have that um, opportunity to do that. Um, but yeah, really, really busy lives. And then realizing that actually it's that oxygen mask thing that unless you take care of yourself, you can't really do that juggling. And so, um, you know, if, as the premise of the book, it's it's ironic, really, how how true that that's proved to be during a pandemic when um, people's mental health was was really at risk when physical health because we were curtailed really weren't we from um, at certain points during lockdown from from you know for those of us that enjoy doing exercise from being able to do that extensively to a sort of 20 minute walk um, isn't quite the same as a, a two hour bike ride or a or a two hour run or something like that so yeah I mean I think um, given that that's what the starting point for the, the book was, um, and then launching it in a, it, during a pandemic, um, all of those things still run true. And um, for so many people and for so many organisations, mental health is just, um, and well-being is just shot right up the agenda um, to, to become just absolutely critical for businesses. Yeah, and for very, very good reason. I mean, I don't, and, and I, know, I know that we, we will have talked about where we've pushed ourselves to the point of exhaustion, too much work to do in too few hours, and and I've spoken to organisations where, you know, um, and some some of the some of the people that have been involved in leadership development work, they've they've pushed themselves. It's been tough for the organisations. They want to get it right, but it's not easy to work out what the right thing is, and every individual um, 
will need to put on their oxygen masks differently. So for some, it's time out and a very long bike ride. For others, it's it's a walk, and for others, it's a dark room and a, and more sleep. You know, and, and it's just so variable in terms of what we all need. Um, but the great thing is, is I think the humanity that we've seen with all the you know, with all the sad stories that have happened over that that period, the, you know, the hardship, the tough side of things, and how people have rallied uh, to look out for each other. So that community, a sense of community, you know, the tribe that you belong to, your sort of social, your social connections, and I think the managers that have um, certainly the some that I've encountered that have had been amazed at how well the teams adjusted have been quite close to their teams, um, and been able to have that regular drop in albeit virtually, because you can't do it in person. And now we're just starting to see, I was with a group yesterday who hadn't seen each other for about a year. And they they just absolutely soaked up the whole, ah, isn't it nice to, <laughs> to be back in the same room? Uh, and they they absolutely loved it. It, it wouldn't have mattered what content we had to cover. I think they were just absolutely delighted to be back in a room, to have some sense of, like, there are th some things that will return to relative normality. Um, and uh, yeah, they weren't all exhausted from the from the journey. Yeah, no, I think I mean I, I, what plays into it quite a lot there is mm. that it's been a time for reflection for a lot of people. So, is this really the company I want to work for because they are looking after me or not? And just um, reflecting on um, your own values again and thinking, do they match? Do they match the organisation that I'm working for? And you know, I've noticed that um, with with clients that I work with. Um, where they've got it superbly right and um, things like festivals of well-being sort of creative approaches to yeah. um, providing people with the tools and the resources that they need virtual festival of well-being and that's that's it's really pushed people on to deliver things that probably would have been a couple of years down the line really mm. um, and the nice thing about that is just engaging people in putting these kinds of events on who then in turn engage their own networks to joining them and the kind of end result of that is what a great place to work. Um, aren't they, um, you know, aren't they great looking after us? Actually, I have a really good feeling. And the thing about having that feeling is that's that's really when something's congruent with your own personal values. Mm. So when you have that sort of, um, I don't know, slight resistance or niggling um, uncertain feeling, that's usually when something's not congruent with your with your values. So. I think a lot of people will have been reflecting on whether they're in the right job, the right organisation, yeah. um, and whether they're being looked after well enough. And of course, you don't always have the luxury to just leave, um, but it could be, you know, particularly in a pandemic, I think for those that were able to carry on working, you're grateful to have a job, you know, but at the same time, um, you, you don't want to view it just as a job. You want to view it as something that you can be productive in, that you enjoy doing, and that you feel valued in. So yeah, I think it's been a real time for reflection during this period um, for organisations and employees to reassess the fit. Yeah, and, and the incredible things we've been able to do with technology as well. So I would never have guessed that we'd be as comfortable having a Zoom call as we are as having a cup of tea. So there are some people that I can't geographically get together with particularly easily because of the sort of geographical spread of the people I work with. But we've become so more adept, so much more adept at using whatever works, yeah. be it virtually, be it meeting up for coffee at a local cafe or, you know, at the office, aligning when you turn up at the office so you can meet up with those you need to meet up with. Um, so I just think I think there's I feel like there's a lot more flexibility um, and how we see our, our how we see ourselves conducting our day to day which is great because if some days you might need to top up that top up that exercise um, account a little bit more than you normally do if you've had a tough week and spent too much time sat at your desk um, and that certainly was what it felt like this week <laughs> lots more lots more time behind the desk needing to get out and get some fresh air and what a great Friday as well in terms of weather today so I think we've um yeah we've adapted I've been amazed at how technology has transformed interactions and actually the volume of work, I have, to, I have to confess, the volume of work in the last year has been more than I've done probably in the last two years because of that, that much, much better use of technology, albeit I'm not brilliant with technology, but I have been able to get through 
um, a lot more variety and a lot more uh, different channels of support, which has been ideal for students that have felt, particularly for the uh, some of the students I work with, they felt a bit stranded and isolated, not being able to be on campus. So, you know, for them, that, that making it okay and more comfortable to be connected by technology um, was a bit of a saviour, I think, um, and in some regards. And then for companies, uh, you know, it's been a great way to keep in touch. Those chat, that channel of communication um, where people don't have to be in the office and it's been safer not to be for whatever reason. So, yeah, it's been, it's been interesting to see that progression. Yeah. I, th I think the thing, the thing though, um, also to consider is, is that we had that um, consistent call to action in the first lockdown to um, make sure you were taking your walk, to make sure you were taking care of yourself. And I just wonder, as we've become much more familiar with these ways of working, and some companies are staying with it, mm -hmm. um, whether it's safety or whether it's efficiency or productivity, that, you know, do we fall back into old um, habits? and actually carry on with having what are now similar workloads, if not greater workloads to what we had before in physical times. And of course, the other aspect of that is the barrier is no longer there between home and work yeah. because you're, you're, you know, you're not commuting, which allows you to, um, you know, gear up for the day. You yeah. don't decompress at the end of the day. Um, you're, you're endlessly at your desk. So it does, it does sort of encourage people to have um, greater awareness about their own self-care and managers can only do so much. And, you know, I wonder to what degree does it become just almost robotic, the checking in um, versus how can you make that feel as though it's authentic and, and it is authentic. How can you make that continue to feel authentic that you're worrying about your staff, you're concerned for them, you're worrying about the hours that they might be working and what the yeah. impact might be on, on family. So it is great that we've got these ways of working, but I think that we can, um, I've noticed a lot um, generally with people I interact with outside of the clients I work with, that you know, if, if you don't put that focus on um, being more disciplined about taking time out, it just becomes more habitual to just carry on slogging in the way that we did before the pandemic um, you know, really kicked in. So. That's that's a thought, and then of course, I mean the other the other sort of aspects of it are, you know, um, the eye strain and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's just about getting the balance right, isn't it? That you go one way or the other um, with mm. it. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it, it's interesting to watch how um, organisations are adjusting somewhat to the doors are open, come back to work when actually a lot of people are thinking I don't want to, because from a sustainability point of view, if that's a high value for you, you might think, well, I don't want to commute and adds to the kind of um you know to to the use of fuel um to the waste of time that some people might see it as if they don't use it for sort of uh compressing up or compressing down so um you know and, and so what we're seeing is the sort of rise of collaboration spaces within offices and that's that's really pinpointing what the value of being together is you don't necessarily need to be sitting side by side in a row in an open plan office doing your individual tasks, but what you do miss is that how that whole collaboration um, piece. So it's interesting to see how the, the actual makeup of offices are, ch are changing in how they organize themselves to just, you, you know, listen to what employees say they want and what they don't want, and then provide that, that environment for them to work in. So that's been quite an interesting thing, I think, that I've, I've noticed um, as things are, are starting to settle a bit and feel as if this is normal. Yeah, there's a new kind of rhythm to that, isn't there? So it's not nine to five, Monday to Friday, um, in the office, turning up at the same office, same desk, which will have been a real wrench for those that that, that was their habit. Um, so unraveling our old habits and getting used to new habits, uh, I think has been a bit of a personal learning opportunity for individuals, as well as companies working out how do we give everybody an opportunity to have a say but also keep people safe. So there's obviously companies are they're balancing all of that, aren't they? Their responsibility to safety for the for the majority, and then also meeting the needs of the individuals. The the um, this week's the first week I've been back in the car commuting. So this week I have had six hours in the car, uh, and it's fine. And and whereas you, I used to that would yeah you know, it, it could be 
eight to 10 hours in the car to get a week's work done, given its site visits and uh, delivery and, what, and whatever else. And that's been quite interesting because fortunately I do enjoy driving, but I did find myself thinking, oh, do I really have to start this whole commuting thing again? <laughs> because actually I, would, I was spending other, that time doing other things. Now you're right about the hours at your desk, you do end up, if you're in the zone and you're working on something, you might put in a 10 hour day instead of a six to eight hour day. And you might even go beyond that if you're up, up against the deadline. But if you're in the flow and you're not getting dehydrated, you're not getting a screen headache, you, you aren't getting a sore back because you've moved enough during the day. If you're in the zone to do that short term, well, who's to say that that's not okay if that's what you need to do, but it's, a, it's about that personal choice. I, I, I wouldn't recommend doing that every day, but I, have, I will confess to having done that some days in order to meet a deadline. Um, and particularly when you're working with um, marking and assessment of work and people are desperate to find out how they've done. So where it's part of the value chain you're delivering, people want to hear from you as soon as you can possibly turn around their work. So there are times when I have done some longer stints, but usually in bad weather, I don't particularly want to go outside. So when it's sunny, uh, I might finish a little earlier and go out on a longer bike ride. So I, I absolutely love that whole personal choice aspect of what we've had in the past year, because uh, I've been very lucky enough to, to be able to carry on some, most threads of work. Um, and obviously some did um, drop off um, and for good reason. But um, yeah. yeah. I think that's um, I think that's true, but and and I think um, you know the other things to that we touch on in the book as well is is on the, the note of self care, is yeah. just having the right fuel to help you um, get through the day as well. So you might be, well, one might be, um, airing on the side of of a workaholic or something like that, perhaps, which is fine, um, but making sure that you you're adding the fuel in to sustain that kind of work level over a period of time, not just for that day. And I've noticed, um, you know, I've been on a particularly busy project for the last six months, which has um, really increased in the last two months. And, you know, one um, all abiding thought that I had over the last couple of months is, aside from, wow, this is really, really busy, but a fantastic project to be involved with. Um, thank goodness that I have a really good exercise regime and that I also have a really good nutrition plan um, which is totally tailored to what works for me. So, you know, I know what buttons to press when I'm feeling in a certain way, what the right foods are. And that doesn't mean to say you need to be an expert in that. You ju it's just about having heightened awareness. So, um, again, you mean it's, one can't just pass these responsibilities to employers, but those kinds of employers that, you know, are in the habit of organising events that talk about the whole gambit between mental, physical, nutritional health, um, you know, are helping employees raise that level of awareness. So I think um, it's just really important that if you're not moving around too much, then at least be eating properly, hydrating properly to just get that fuel in. What I notice if I'm sitting at a desk for too long a period of time, my legs hurt. You know, I need to move them. Um, you know, I need I get I get a little bit stiff and that's just sort of sitting in the same position. So, yeah, I think it's um, I think it's really that self-care having the right fuel at the right time um, and maybe with the with the sort of self-choice bit that you're talking about is the awareness around when you're most productive Absolutely. so if you find that you're you're sort of really good in the morning you you might actually find that five hours going at the pace your body loves um, might be the best you can do in a day and even though you're going to sit at your desk for perhaps another three or four hours mm. the, the actual work rate might drop significantly so Again, it comes back to just that self-awareness about how do I work? What's my work rate? Um, am I in a flexible enough situation where my employer recognizes that, that I can get this done in this level of time and in the afternoons, perhaps, you know, um, maybe there is some flexibility. But I also think it sort of, um, it highlights the thing about the blurring of the lines between um, work-life balance. So, um, you know, as, as parents, if you, you've got responsibilities for taking the kids to certain clubs or, you know, other sorts of responsibilities, it's nice to have that level of trust with an employer. If you have that, if you're in the right kind of job and they value you and you value them for them to give you that flexibility, because we are all working um, longer because we're living longer. So that means we're going to have a longer retirement 
and if we're going to have a longer retirement then somebody's got to pay for it so we're going to work longer for, for doing that but actually isn't it nice to think about that it's not just about the work it's about having that nice blurring of the edges bringing the outside in the outside world in as well and having such a flexible timetable that you get your work done but then you can also you know get your play done as well and that's good for the soul you know chicken soup for the soul yeah, yeah the um i think the resilience formula for individuals and in organizations will take some working out and i and, and i was privy to a conversation just earlier this week about a an individual who was not wanting to come into the office because it actually clashed with dropping off at school time and I thought and I, I listened as the as the the manager that was describing the situation was explaining their perspective and I thought they've got a little bit of tension there there's a bit of nominal tension there they need to work that through and and that whole balance of yeah, what, what are their most productive hours? And actually, is that half an hour later a, a deal breaker? Um, or, yeah, and, and, and it was just, they, they hadn't actually had the opportunity to sit down and talk that through. A lot of organizations will have been through that through new policies and revisions of you know, the whole working day, the, um, the whole marrying up of shift workers and change over times and all that sort of thing. So a lot of organizations will have had time to work that through, but some may not have particularly if they haven't had much contact time. So I think there'll be, there'll, there'll be some, um, you know, a little bit of a hangover until they all get to sort that out. And we're back to an understanding of what allows us to be at our most productive. And we certainly know for sure that happy people are more productive. So what is it about belonging to that organization and creating the value that that organization delivers that makes that individual that individual employee delighted or happy to be part of it and how do you maintain it and it, and it does need maintenance doesn't it it's it's um yeah the yeah. contract <laughs> yeah definitely i mean having that sort of yeah. common common purpose is is essential and again that 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 blurring of the edges and flexibility about the working day it may not just be about you know enabling you to carry out caring responsibilities but mm -hmm. you know if you can work for someone where you've got the sense of purpose and you can deliver on it and that might be that you want to give back to your local community and that might be you know a purpose that you personally have a cause that you personally have um, or it could be as part of the organization's um, community support so because we know don't we that in the, in the sort of five ways to well-being that actually supporting um, your local community, it, you know, you do good, makes you feel good. Hence, you know, one of the reasons why the book's called Feel Good, Do Good, Work. Um, because if you feel good, then you're more likely to feel productive and feel good about what you're doing. And, you know, your, your, the quality of your work is, is going to be sort of very positive about that. So I think, yeah, the sense of belonging is, is this an organisation that gives me that flexibility where I can realise my causal purpose I can give back, um, I can contribute to what they're doing and I believe in what they're doing for their local community. Um, you know, and it's it's much more of a kind of a working partnership. Or if you're not working for an organization like that, what can you do to help them evolve, um, you know, and, and change? Or do you need to be really thinking about thinking about where you are right now? And, and I've seen that firsthand. Um, the, the, there's been a lot of movement in job roles. Some of the people I knew a year ago are no longer working for the company they were with for various reasons. Some of it's individual choice, some of it's been redundancies. And after that, sort of, particularly for those with, where it's been redundancy related, um, it's one or two of them took a little while to assimilate a new tribe, if you like. And um, they have, uh, yeah, they have now moved on and I really, you can see that they've got back into gear again, but it has taken a little bit of time and a bit of, bit of reflection and, and self-care to get there. Uh, yeah. yeah, whether it's pandemic related or not, redundancy is not, it's not pretty. It, it, it's a little bit of a tough journey to go through. It absolutely is, and particularly if it's, if it's happening remotely. So, yeah. you know, just as it's difficult, it, it can be difficult to have a sense of belonging when you are part of a, a remote organization, a, a sort of a, a yeah, remote virtual organization. Mm -hmm. So that sort of brings up interesting thoughts about how do I belong if, I, if I'm not with people? 
and that's that's elicited lots of creative thoughts around um you know whether it's sort of let's do uh, you know i've been aware of let's do a 20 minute coffee morning with different people work our way around our team next week i'm going to spend 20 minutes getting to know you over a virtual coffee in a couple of weeks time it will be you and running this this kind of cycle um but equally on the redundancy side that's you know as you say it's a very challenging situation anyway but for when we were in the depths of the pandemic wow how difficult not just for those going through it but for those for, for who are administering it to actually you know really support um support the workforce really but then i guess the other thing that i've noticed um in in during this period is if you remember right back at the beginning of, of um the first lockdown um, you know, there were those people with the, with the shift in job and trying to adapt. Um, so I get involved in organising lots of events. And of course, physical events just had to change to virtual events just like this. Um, and that was quite a sort of steep learning curve. And for others, you might not be organising those sorts of things, but they may have found their workload reduce an awful lot, which can then have that counter effect of, oh, am I contributing, um, worrying about your job? You know, are you, is that very visible to people? Um, am I pulling my weight as part of the rest of the team? Again, a sense of wanting to belong, but wanting to contribute. But I think for, for kind of savvy organisations, they were quite quick to say, don't worry. Um, we just want to make sure you're all right at this stage. We all need to get into a different tempo and a different rhythm. Our sense of belonging might differ and actually use this time to learn new tools, but also learn new skills. So there, you know, you, we've seen the rise of, um, you know, LinkedIn, obviously other online providers are available, but LinkedIn free learning, um, lots of people have worked their way through those kinds of courses or through the sort of um, widely available courses within businesses um, that they offer. But just being aware that some of the people listening in to here may be running small businesses and therefore don't have a learning management system with lots of courses to access, having something like LinkedIn learning where you can just, you know, work has dropped off a little bit or you've been furloughed or something like that that actually a great way to support your mental health is to develop yourself again another one of the five ways to well-being mm -hmm. so um, what a brilliant thing that you can come out of a pandemic um, with a greater toolkit than when you went into it yeah and I think for the small businesses and the entrepreneurs out there that are you know perhaps and on the uh, exponential curve of trying to make something happen that they've dreamed about or they've got a vision for, you know, it's great to have spaces like the Westminster Library space to do that social connection um, and albeit virtually previously, but now they, they have a physical space as well to uh, collaborate in um, and to share stories, share stories about the challenges uh, and actually uh, a problem, problem shared is a problem halved, isn't it? And, and our social connection, our network are really valuable to us so I think even as a if you're a sole trader or an entrepreneur uh, or with a small team that making sure that you have access to because we are such social creatures to the, the the right network so that you you can have your conversation and your relaxing chat or you can speak to your mentor about financial um, financial matters that you just can't quite get your head around uh, if, you, if, if you're not the if you're the technically expert but not the finance expert where do you go to have that conversation um, mm. so I think having these collaborative spaces for small businesses and your sort of wider network uh, is really vital a vital lifeline and I bet you even more so in the last year absolutely and I think where I've seen that work very well when when I was first um, opening up my business as a, as a sole trader trader yeah. and then went on to a limited um, company as an individual um, was the the idea of a jelly and I think this I, th I think it was an American thing I think it was an American thing and really it was um, a kind of point in the week when um, lots of small businesses individuals um, would get together in a particular location which could ideally work within um, the, the Westminster Business Library to just agree to pay a, a fiver to one person that took responsibility for convening it that person would make sure that there was endless coffee and cake and then really you'd have one big area, one table, everybody sat around the table and just got on with their work. But it was very, um, you know, a very collaborative space. Um, you know, the, the, the web design person might be working there. The graphic design type person for another business might be working there. The self-employed accountant might be working there. And you could have somebody working who then might 
encounter a problem and they might say oh you know I'm, I'm useless on spreadsheets does anybody know how to you know and then the person comes around and says well actually um as as an accountant i use spreadsheets all the time let me have a look but you it then means that you build this kind of um professional community for yourself that's supportive and it's not just about trying to sell to each other but it's about creating what you would otherwise have in a larger organization for yourselves as individuals so this kind of co-working space is brilliant to have that happen and again more chicken soup for the soul um you you then have a sense of belonging because you've got this group that you come to every week or every other week whatever the interval is that you want to do for it and you've got that nice feeling of thinking you're helping others out which is of course what happens when you're in a workspace together that you know i was saying earlier on that if you're focused on your job it's possibly not as important to go into the office to just sit there in a row each doing your own job as it is to sort of use the time to collaborate if you're going to come together but having said that if if you do get stuck then you know I, I guess even though there's so many chat functions and bots to kind of help us online when we get stuck with something it is really nice to just pop over to somebody on the other side of the the office who might be struggling and just give them a few pointers and, and there's such a lot of time um, saved in doing that as well. I think the the thing I've noticed about um, the ones that perhaps suffered the most for lack of contact is those new to an organisation. So your apprentices, your, your interns and, and other roles new to an organisation and companies have worked really hard to, you know, to make that as great as they can, but you cannot replicate the, the, the couple of minutes chat that an apprentice might want to ask a question of somebody and, and they in that moment they need that understanding to then move on to their next next piece. So I think I think they that that particular group of employees have, will have really found it very, very tough to make the progress you'd normally make when starting somewhere new. Um, yeah. yeah. And I've I've heard a lot of effort, I've heard about a lot of effort going into trying to smooth the way um and yeah that's been that's been probably quite a tough one to crack yeah i think um i must it's a good point to raise actually because i must admit but my experience of that in the last um, 18 months of the pandemic has been really positive um so i guess um on the one hand things like those kind of virtual coffee mornings where individuals are matched with other people great if you're joining a group and you get 20 minutes to spend with fred even if you even if you get 20 minutes to spend you're not new and you get 20 minutes to spend with fred that you, you otherwise wouldn't be taking the time out to do you get to learn things about colleagues you never knew before but for new people coming in it was you know i've seen that work as a great way to work around the team of course people will have been on endless zoom quizzes which probably when this all started and it was novel for a few months also helped um you know new people to come on board um and, and again i guess almost shadowing um you know when when you're new and, and you're perhaps joining a new team and just you can set shadowing up quite virtually but one of the great things actually is um as a sort of a footnote to, to having done this book i was exploring um you know on the subject of onboarding um mm. care packages and that's been a really nice spin i think for organizations so yeah. for some businesses um they may if you think about hybrid working so we're all working virtually but we might, might physically receive something in the post that makes us feel all warm and fuzzy and obviously we've got to be really sensitive to the fact that people are very sensitive to covid so there's certain things they don't want to receive in the post but actually what's been quite nice is um the rise of onboarding packs and the creativity around it so you're joining a new organization you get something nice sent to you it might be all linked to well-being so it could be even down to what you what you pop in the bath salts you pop in your bath or it could be soothing teas or it could be a little book on mindfulness or you know um, perhaps how to get started with yoga or whatever it might be and i think what's also quite nice is those organizations that have subscribed to that um where it literally is a monthly subscription so without going over the top if you think about it if it's if it's sort of 10 pound a head for somebody in your team and you do that every month that's probably quite a small price to pay it's probably a couple of coffees a week isn't mm -hmm. it really when you think about how we've become this society that um has to buy coffee all the time when years ago we had the coffee at home left the house went to work you might take your own you might use a bit of instant at work no we're all spending about three or four quid individually on a coffee 
well, why not actually in these virtual times when you can't do that, why not subscribe to a service where you're paying a tenner, a tenner a month that gives somebody that sort of nice warm feeling, whether they're onboarding and they're new, or it's about the existing people mm. who might need a nice virtual stroke. Yes, I, I have to say, I haven't had a care package from an employer, but then I wouldn't do because I work for a variety of organizations in various capacities. But I did have a very significant care passage package out of the blue from my niece, who obviously felt I needed a gin care package. So obviously gin is very popular at the moment. And um, I got rather a lot of it. <laughs> for my birthday. So that was that was a that was a really it was a really fun moment to see this exciting package arrive out of the blue. Um, and it pr probably wouldn't have mattered what was in it, actually. It was just the whole fun of opening it and finding all the little bits and pieces and samplers and tasters. Um, and it's funny enough, you mentioned the creativity and innovation piece, because it was when running a creativity module for a, a group of apprentices uh, towards the back end of last year. And they were they were really flat. They, I could tell, you know, the, the mood, the energy, uh, they were just fed up with um, furlough, not furloughed, working from home. Um, some had to go back in and some had so there was a whole division of in this particular cohort they didn't have the same circumstances um, so they were they were struggling so I did send them a care package of all right and it included a chocolate frog and a few other bits and pieces but the chocolate frog frog was a play on um, Brian Tracy's book eat that frog one for a bit of fun um, but two also just just to show them that you know, it was taking notice of the mood and just to boost them and it did it got them all chatting about what was the point of the chocolate frog <laughs> so, yeah, yeah absolutely just a bit of fun isn't it really just to as you say to lighten lighten the mood but um yeah i think it's it's um it's certainly forced people to get creative i mean you talk, talk about gin i mean people are doing virtual gin testings and, and that's a that's great you know whether it's that or or what it might be for team building or you can still have your kind of virtual award ceremonies. And, you know, being really, um, being very sort of um, mindful that probably a lot of people listening today are entrepreneurs, single business owners, and thinking, well, I don't have lots of employers, employees. Um, but again, it's thinking about building that community between other, um, yeah. other organizations who are in the same boat. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly spent a number of years um, in business networking groups. And um, largely, to be honest, I, I, you know, it might sound a very a lack of commercialism, but it wasn't really to go in and sell. It was to build relationships, to build trust, but also to have a, a, a community that you could talk about how's business going for you and, um, you know, what, what kinds of challenges are you facing that aren't necessarily specific to what your business is about, but just in general, um, you know, what might be going on within the local business community that we all need to get together and get behind. So, um, so I, I think it's as important for individuals um, in small businesses to think about that cohesive shared value um, of being together and co-working as it is about being in a big business where, you know, you might have tons of employees. The principles are the same, really. And it's mm -hmm. about having that sort of different outlook um, to think about it laterally. Um, and I, I know just thinking about somebody I was coaching recently, um, I, I think going back to the thought about values, just having had that conversation where they were looking for um, a new role mm -hmm. and I must get another job at all costs. And it was very much focused on what can I find that fits the hours around the kids and covers the bills. Um, and there was a pattern there, a, rec a recurring pattern around dissatisfaction of past jobs. So what we talked about was what if you looked for an organization where they do all these great things for you. You know, you've got shared values. They've got a great causal purpose. They give you flexibility to be able to manage your work-life balance. What if you actually did a bit of research to find those organizations, first of all, then create a short list of questions and companies that you want to approach, remembering that it's a two-way street. It's not just about, can I have that job, please, that you're interviewing me for? It's also, do I want to work here? And again, just thinking about any small businesses um, who, who or large businesses or you as an individual looking for a job, um, it's important to get that right because that's part of your reputational um, due diligence, how people see you, how you come across, um, you know, as, as a prospective employer. 
Yeah, and I think the um, I, I know in my own career, I've I've chosen to leave an institution because of a change uh, in the role and responsibilities that was a mismatch with what I loved about the job. So I've certainly that's been part of my decision making personally in changing roles. Um, and also in, in coaching some of the um, managers I've worked with, you know, working through the tensions that you experience at work. So remembering what you value and why you value it. So as well as that being looked after by the company, but you looking after yourself and not becoming, not playing the victim because you've, you've got a sense of, of um, being in that space of playing out the victim role because you've, you've lost sight of what your contribution or your value contribution is. Um, so those kind of coaching conversations are, are all about restore, restoring um, that line of sight of what matters to you in your day job, both in terms of behaviors, um, actually, how, how you want to behave and be seen to, um, in terms of how others perceive you, but also um, what you're expecting in return so that the trading, that reciprocity piece. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, as well as doing it, the organization and you and your sort of personal view of your relationship with your organization, I think there is, there's a lot, there, there sometimes can be a lot of value in reflecting on your um, value contribution and the relationships that you've got in the workplace. Because if there is, if there is something, so, if something's gone awry, there's probably something to reflect on in that space. And that's where coaching conversations can be really helpful to help defrag what's going on there. Yeah, and I think um, it, it just makes me reflect a little bit that we've talked a lot about sort of um, the employee taking the initiative about reconciling their values with the organisational values and then understanding sort of viscerally if you have a feeling where things seem a bit off, that's probably because something is counter to your values. But just focusing on some of the research that I did in the book for the book with a number of um, large organizations to the benefit of, of small and large businesses who might be listening and potential employees who might be listening. So I, I talked to a number of organizations like Greg's, very well known. Um, I talked to Adnams, the brewers, um, a construction company called MCS. So they, they um, build um, things like large automotive dealership um, um, buildings. And um, I also talked to charities, Parkinson's UK, um, Highways England, uh, Voltex as well, the financial services um, organisation, the Quality Care Commission, um, and, you know, and various others. So just in talking to them, I also asked a number of questions about what their leaders um, found um, important about their people. So I just thought it might be worth um, taking a couple of minutes to just run through some of those things, just to give a bit of, um, bit of pause for thought, if you like, and really to sort of get a bit more detail on that shameless plug here you can always buy feel good do good work it, it is available on amazon but actually if you um pop your name in the chat or you contact um westminster business library um reese samuels there who's who you heard from earlier on hosting the call for anybody that does join this call or run through this call we are offering 40 percent off so the book for 10 pounds the printed copy if if you want to buy it and when you buy it you've, you've got access to lots of exercises and resources and things in there that you'll find really useful but just to give you a bit of summary about what the leaders within these organizations found important about their people is you know um, having a positive attitude so that every day is a great day to be at work um, feeling that you're free enough to bring your authentic self to work so you can just be yourself so that whole thing we've all laughed about you know seeing inside each other's houses through the pandemic what we're wearing um, you know how we're wearing it how we've how our rooms are just you know that extra dimension of getting to know each other but it also brings out another level of authenticity so um, and if you feel that you can be your true authentic self then you're probably more likely to unleash your potential um, in in your job um, I guess the other thing that they found really important is um, is how important it is for people to have visible access to their leaders so I, I've certainly run a number of leadership programs, engagement programs, where we've made it really, really easy for people to connect with leaders that they otherwise would just think as somebody um, 
situated very, very far above them and out of reach. So just being being able to ask any kinds of questions really around that. Um, but actually, um, I think organisations that practice honesty and authenticity um, in every way possible throughout your whole journey with the business, also um, leaders find that really important for their people. Um, and I guess when you've got the shared purpose as well is something that, that leaders as much as employees want to see happen as well, because um, without the, the might of the many, um, we can't you know, help the wider population with some of the causes that we want to make a difference in. So there are quite a lot of um, a lot of things there, as well as things like having the right skills and experience. So I, building an organisation and having the organisational design that allows people to move around in their jobs so that they can develop, um, they can expand their knowledge, they can learn new things, they can join new teams. And it's thinking about creating a sense of well-being through making that sort of fluid movement around a business, expanding your experience possible. So those were just some things I wanted to just um, shine the light on, really. Yeah, and um, in some job roles, that's very accessible. There are some roles where you're a little bit more restricted, but even in slightly restricted roles where you, you, you need to run a production line or you need to run a certain process and only some people have the skill set to run that particular process, even in that situation, it's really important to understand whether or not doing the same job day in, day out is going to be enough to keep somebody's motivation mojo going. And for a lot of, um, and it's, this is not age related. <laughs> this is at any age, you know, some of us need a little bit of variety. Um, and one of the, one of the things that in terms of organizational design and um, potentially revising policies around the whole job description piece, you know, job co-creation. So where you're redesigning um, the around a person's strengths and capabilities and building on those, but focusing. So rather than a person fitting a job description, making the best use of whatever skills and strengths that that particular person comes to work with. Uh, and that's far more likely to uh, keep them in the zone, uh, operating in flow, <laughs> if, um, if you use one of the models that looks at this. And there's a lot of research on this as well. So there, there's some really good reasons for changing our perspective on how we allocate people to job roles. Uh, and most of us have, a, have aspects of our jobs that we might find a little tedious. We're not all good at administration, but we might all like the front of house work, you know, the, the, the fun parts of the putting events together rather than the, the Gantt chart that might, might sit behind it, you know, the big project plan. But yeah, so I think it's playing to people's strengths uh, as a really key part of, um, yeah, perhaps fueling the motivation engine uh, in a reliable way in an ongoing way. And some of the companies that you mentioned do do that. Um, and actually one, one of the organizations I visited earlier this week they're very good at job rotation and job roles and all of these new starters tend to do an element of um, job rotation. So they get a really good feel for where their strengths might be best put to use within the business rather yeah. than go straight into a single job. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't agree more. I mean, that's um, I think that's my point, really, is just to sort of give that variety. I mean, yeah, some people don't, might not like variety, but just to give that that sense of variety um, an opportunity to move around, expand your skills. But also having a, struct a structure that does allow others who perhaps experience that to act as mentors um, and, and coach internally. So, you know, if you think about it, if you're jo you know, joining a new organisation in a pandemic or not, mm -hmm. there is a lot that you can do. I mean, you can assign a mentor to somebody and, and that person will keep an eye on, on you, even if you're working remotely. Um, you know, and obviously if you're, you're new to a business, then... Um, you would expect to be in a role for a reasonable length of time, but perhaps if that length of time is a year or eight months, you know, and you move around. In fact, people on graduate development programs are usually eight, you know, four roles within a two year period. Mm. In a way, in a pandemic, you could argue that that is a great um, sort of setup because eight months in one role, one team, get to know them, you know, move on to another team. So at the end of um, two years, and let's face it, we've been in this pandemic for 18 months. So somebody that might have started a graduate development program at the beginning of the pandemic's already been in three teams of varying sizes. So they've probably got to know 
more people per capita than others that have been in the role for a longer period of time. Um, and then if you, you add on perhaps the benefit of having some kind of a mentor as well, who can signpost different people for you to speak to, um, the way to get to certain resources, the best way to get sort of certain things done, then you could be flying, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you know, usually after those those kinds of programs, you go on then to a sort of a, a more, um, a longer period of time in, in a set job. But if you are in an organization whose culture is to move you around, you could be almost the eternal graduate um, that you could be doing this for, for a great length of time if, if that's and you know let's remember the survival of the fittest it's the ones that um, are prepared to adapt who are the ones that are likely to to survive um, rather than those that may I suppose be like an ostrich sticking their head in the sand and denying what's going on around you you know things are unfortunately or fortunately whichever way you look at it never going to be the same again um, so you know it's it's trying to make the best of that. I think the, the ostrich head in the sand piece uh, in some cases, and this is as well as the coaching and mentoring, and some organisations have gone uh, gone down that line uh, very thoroughly. They have very well-structured programmes and they do maximise advocacy, mentoring and coaching. And you can see the difference that that makes in terms of the opportunities that come to light. Right job at the right time for the right person, ready to go. You know, confident uh, skills intact and right sort of skills. The the bit about the ostrich and the head head in the sand piece. I think I agree that there'll be some people around who perhaps it's how do you protect yourself? So the protectionism or you know what you do, what kicks in to help you protect what you know. If you've got so much uncertainty, the only thing that you're certain about is clocking on and clocking off. You might want to protect that quite vigorously, um, and for the, the, the other thing that you, you mentioned earlier about the whole well-being piece and how you know how mental health and well-being has has been raised right to the the top of the agenda and as you get to know as you as you get to know your team and you maintain good contacts uh, be it small or large teams be it your small uh, small business wider network though some of those things can be signs of symptoms that something's not right you know that and actually if you've got people noticing what's going on for you even if you haven't noticed it for yourself, that safety net of people who might call out, are you really okay? Because they, they know that that's not your normal modus operandi. You wouldn't normally be pessimistic and that day you are. So where's the optimism gone? You know, has it, <laughs> what, why has it gone west for, for, for yeah. a So I think it's the symptoms, signs and symptoms that something's not right could be that day that you put your head in the sand because you just you can't cope with any more that day you're done um, and I think that the more people have those networks of contacts both in the workplace and outside of our, our wider strategic networks you know that's great for helping keep uh, keeping an eye on, on each other and keeping each other above board if you like doing doing the good work that you love doing because you you feel yeah. up to it and isn't it interesting? I mean, I, certainly over the last, I would say, seven years now, um, mm -hmm. I've, I've certainly been aware of um, the steady rise of mental health as, as, as a, you know, something to go to the top of the agenda. But in the last, I mean, I think it's three or four years since I trained to be a mental health first aider. Um, it's been mm -hmm. very interesting to see how that's become a very common um skill um and role within organizations with with you know uh, who would have thought you know it was very normal wasn't it to have a first aider um mm. but actually to have a mental first aider is a real step change in the last few years and there and it's so, it's so much more common and i think the other the other thing that i've noticed as well and again this is a reflection on the type of organization you might be working for when you join and you think oh actually um on the induction information, you know, you've got your fire marshals, you've got your first aid people, mm. you've got your mental health first aiders, but you might have your well-being um, champions and you might have your sustainability champions. And just by virtue of the fact that the organization has been structured to incorporate those um, and to have multiple individuals who take those roles, I mean, in a way, you've created a network right there of activists and ambassadors for that kind of approach and behavior who then that then permeates through their networks as well 
So it's a it's a really interesting, it's not just because of the pandemic that this has happened, but those savvy organizations that started to get these structures in place beforehand is going to have been pay, reaping, you know, reaping the rewards yeah. and paying dividends, a really positive thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, yeah, keep chipping away, leading by example. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, definitely leading by example because you know, let's let's not forget we we are a culture. Um, in fact, most countries are that that is driven by social media, and as as part of that, things like Glassdoor, you know, where people will talk freely about um, would I work there? No, would I work there? Brilliant. And you know, we we can all research and look for the right kind of organisations to work for. It's the information's readily available. So, yeah, I mean, th those are not the reasons to. Um, to go and take the right approach, but just be aware if you're not taking the right approach as an employer, you know, it's it's going to be very visible when people do the research into who they want to go and work for. I can see Reese has popped up. Yes. Yeah. Actually, Reese has popped up and the cat's popped up as well. Oh, what, what a coincidence, I suppose. Yeah. I know it is. I wonder if there's a connection. Yeah. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm a secret cat, possibly. <laughs> um, no. um, thank, thanks, guys, um, for that. Um, there isn't much time for Q&A, um, but we've got, well, there's this one question that I think I wanted to ask, and I think somebody else asked um, in the chat as well, um, mm -hmm. was that in, like, in regards to sort of the rise in unemployment um, that is happening at the moment, do you see the workforce changing or sort of morphing more towards community work, or, or how do you see that pattern evolving um, as, as we proceed in, in the future? Well, wow, that yeah, it's it's a it's a big question, isn't it? And there's there's not one way to resolve it fully. But I think the if, if your sense of well being comes from being involved in things and doing things, then being unemployed, uh, tough as it may be to see it as a gift, it might be a gift and an opportunity to get involved in some community community based things because we are such social social animals. Investing time and effort and a cause that is very close to your heart will keep you going. It'll keep you, keep you alive, not, not in a physical sense, but in a sort of your, your minds, you're socializing, you're interacting, you, you'll get to know a different group of people. You might decide you're going to change career. And it could be that golden opportunity, one door closes and another opens. But as you can tell from that answer, I'm a bit of an optimist and a cup half full person. But yeah, if, and having been made redundant in the past, um, it was at the time a gift, and I would encourage anybody who is in that situation to see it as a gift to reflect and and regroup and take a take a stance on what you care about and move forward from that position. Yeah, and I, I think you're absolutely right. And 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 building on that, you know, fundamentally um, to go and do something like that, what what a great opportunity to help your own family and friends mm -hmm. if, if you've got if you're given the time to put something back into your local community there's an instant impact that's got to be a, a real feel-good thing you get a structure you know so some, some of the thing about redundancy is just not having that familiar structure every day you know where you know you've got that routine and you do this and you do that so to, to get involved in community work is it will give you that structure but the other thing is is the, the skills that you could mm -hmm. gather whether it's communication whether it's organization whether you're, you know, without realizing it, maybe you're co coaching and mentoring. So at the end of it, you know, you end up with an enhanced skill set that, you know, can transcend any job. It doesn't have to just be um, specific to the cause that you're supporting. It can be something that will work for you anywhere. So I think from listening to the pair of us, we're, we're very much um, in favor, big advocates, um, can't really see a downside. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, awesome. Um, so well, thank you both for your uh, expertise uh, this evening. It's been um, um, a pleasure to have both of you talk about you know, the current state of affairs, but also how things will evolve in the future too. So that's been a, a real eye-opener for a lot of our, much of our audience, um, I would hope. Um, yeah, so that about, that about wraps things up for the, um, for today. So thank you both for coming. Um, I've put a few, I've put a few links in the chat. Um, about the services that we provide, but also um, that discount that Annette and Kelly are both offering, which is a, a great offer to purchase this book, which will be great for entrepreneurs and those um, looking to add some community well-being into their service as well. Um, 
but I'm not sure if you have anything more to add, Kelly, on in it or just that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, you go. <laughs> no, just thank you, Reese, for the opportunity to um, you know, to reflect to reflect on what we've done, but also to hear about Westminster Libraries and what you're offering. I think it's a great it's it's a great um, hub for people to have access to. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Reece. Awesome. Really appreciate the opportunity and to everybody listening as well, just to take in the time. Um, you've got a wonderful facility there. Um, I've been exploring online. So, um, yeah, very envious of those that are in proximity <laughs> to be able to use it. So congratulations on all the hard work to getting it off the ground. No, thank you. We're, we're very honoured to hear those words. So uh, much appreciated. Um, but yeah, thank you both for, for attending this evening. Thank you to our audience as well. Who's, who's um, tuned in uh, for this talk. Um, there'll be future events um, happening uh, this year in regards to sort of uh, business and libraries as well. So just do, they, do, um, do stay tuned um, mm -hmm. for that. Um, but without further ado, I'll thank you both for arriving and I wish everyone um, a very good evening. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.